Okay, so language, language, starting off with our usual strategy, starting off with what the behaviors look like, and the place to begin is with some of the universals of language across all the different human languages, approximately 6,000 of them, and all sorts of depressing news about that to come. First off, something that they all have in common is semanticity. The notion that there is an endless array, an infinite array of sounds that could be generated by voices, uh, sounds, and what all languages do is bucket them, as per usual, break up this continuum of sounds into units of meaning. And where meaning corresponds to a unit itself. The notion of that being, a pair of people we'll hear more about later, Mark Hauser and Noam Chomsky, pointing out that even though you could generate an infinite number of words, you could never generate 6.5 words. That's part of what semanticity is about. Not only do you break continua of sounds into buckets of meaning, but they are discrete buckets. You cannot have partial words. Also, what else is universal to languages? The possibility of embedded clauses, and ones that get considerably more complicated. All languages not only have A can do B, but they all have A under this condition, but not under that condition, and sometimes on Tuesdays, but never on Thursdays, can do B. All of them will have embedded clauses by, like that, that being a universal. What else? All of them show recursion, which is a really important property. Old term for it would be something like generativity, which is all languages have a finite number of words, and all languages have the potential to generate an infinite number of combinations. And all you have to do to see that is come up with what you believe is the longest sentence in all of history. And all you have to do is put at the beginning of it, Bill said that blah, blah. And once that's there, then you have to have Jane said that Bill said that. And thus, you have an infinite generativity. All languages, finite number of words, infinite number of combinations. What else? Very important feature of human language when we get to comparing it with animal communication, displacement. We can talk about stuff from the past. We can talk about stuff from the future. We can talk about stuff on the other side of the planet. We can talk about things that are emotionally distant from us. And as we'll see with animals, the overwhelming majority of animal communication is about emotion. I am upset, I am angry, I am afraid, I am horny, I am hungry, I am whatever it is. Humans instead can talk about chess strategies. Displacement, displacement from emotion. Related to that, there's arbitrariness of language. What do I mean by this? In virtually any animal species that is communicating, for example, I am terrified out of my mind, it's going to involve something resembling that species equivalent of screaming, screaming and emoting loudly and saying ah, or some equivalent of that. We are able to say, I am feeling a deeply corrosive sense of disquietude at the moment. We don't have the actual words being tied inextricably into their meaning. You you cannot look at a word and say, whoa, that word has an awful lot of right angles in the letters there. It must be a word that tells you something about you know, this type of philosophy. It's an arbitrary relationship between the signal and the message. And that is universal to human languages. What else is universal? The ability to have this lecture, meta-communication, to communicate about communication, to be able to step back from language and discuss it in and of itself. And one extreme version of it is to have people who devote their times to inventing language. Two examples. One is the French have some some national institution which is meant to save the French language from the sullying effects of words from all sorts of other languages. And they make all sorts of rulings as to what words are now allowed to become French. And I don't know what they decided about Le Big Mac, whether that came in. But this is a body that studies and decides what words should be part of its language. Similarly, there is a college in Washington, DC called Gallaudet College, which is for deaf individuals. And it's 
ground zero for American Sign Language. It's the place where some band of sign language elder poobahs sit around and decide on new words in that language. As we'll see, that's not a very effective strategy, but nonetheless, that is meta-communication. Every single language has the ability to talk about language. Every single language and its practitioners use motherese, use baby talk. Baby talk where typically the mother, but not exclusively so, will speak to a child in a high-pitched voice, emphasizing melodic and vowel aspects of it, repeating phrases, focusing very closely in on the baby's face. All of these languages have motherese. And the question becomes, is motherese about emotion or is it about instruction? And what you see is some real similarities between motherese and how people often talk to their pets. And you're usually not trying to teach your pets how to speak your, home, your native language. One difference, though, with speaking to pets, you get the repetitive, high-pitched voice stuff. You don't get the close clarity. You do not make a point of making the sound slowly and clearly. You are not teaching your dog language there. So that is a difference. Nonetheless, in every single language, you get mother ease. Next, you have what's going to be an issue throughout when trying to make sense of the biology of this, when we're looking at what's going on in the brain and that sort of thing, is language in those cases, what you're doing with your lips, your larynx, your throat, is language mostly about the motoric aspects. This is a system involving the generation of sound and the reception of sound, or is it more about cognition? Is it more about the conceptual structure? And the general view in the field is it's overwhelmingly about the latter. And some of the strongest evidence for that comes from sign languages, American Sign Language. American Sign Language, which shows all sorts of very subtle, deep properties that are similar to spoken language amid it not being a spoken language and amid using completely different systems in the brain. One example of this, you look at babies who are born deaf and will be learning American Sign Language, and right around the age that hearing infants begin to babble with their spoken language, deaf babies begin to babble in American Sign Language and are starting to make signs with that. Just like hearing babies, they tend to babble the most before going to sleep. It's the same property. There is not a rule that says somewhere around nine months of age, begin making sounds that are fragments of stuff you've been hearing. Somewhere around nine months of age, begin to practice fragments of whatever communicative system you are being exposed to. Similar evidence that language is about the cognitive structure and not about lips and tongue when older individuals who are native speakers of American Sign Language happen to have a stroke, they can get the exact same sort of uh, communication disorders in sign language that speaking individuals do. And we'll see that in more detail, what some of these pathologies look like. It's coded for in very similar parts of the brain. Both spoken language and sign language have something called prosody, which we will hear more about. Prosody is not the words in a language. Prosody is the tone, what you're doing with your face, what you're doing with your hands, the gestures, your body posture, all the things that are communicated through those routes there, all the things which virtually by definition, email, you can't do prosody with beyond little smiley face things. That's about the limits of prosody. You find prosody in American Sign Language. People doing very different facial expressions. One classic example of sign language prosody is if somebody in American Sign Language is describing a conversation between two people, they will subtly shift their body as they're going from one person to the other there. This is prosody. This is reinforcing the information. This is a dialogue that this is exactly what spoken language people do in terms of that prosody, the same thing in American Sign Language. Language. Next, amazing bit of evidence from ASL, American Sign Language, that this is about cognition, not about lips and tongue, what makes it for language, which is you look at someone who is born deaf and where ASL is their native language, and when you are signing to them, their auditory cortex activates. 
the same regions that do some of the initial processing of hearing language. It's, again, it's about the, the deep concepts within. More evidence, you get accents in American Sign Language, and apparently this consists of different speeds, slurring, that sort of thing, and there's regional accents in ASL, and I have no idea if it matches in some ways the accents of the spoken English there. My guess is no, but you have accents there. You have poetry in American Sign Language, where you will have a sign that is some movement followed by this movement, and I'm obviously just making this up, and then you can have this movement followed by the same movement, that counts as rhyming words. You get poetry in American Sign Language. And you get storage of American Sign Language when it is a second language in the same sorts of regions of the cortex as when people get a second spoken language. This is not merely about language is what you do with sounds and hearing. Language is instead about the underlying cognitive structures. Okay. Cool thing. If you ever start learning American Sign Language, almost certainly somewhere on the first day they're going to show you what a cool language it is by teaching you the following word. This is always the first word you need to learn in American Sign Language. Okay, just to show you, building blocks of it, this is the word for milk. Okay, you can kind of see some iconic stuff going on there as to this means milk. So what does this word mean in American Sign Language? Who said that? <laughs> How do you know? Do you know it already? It's his favorite joke. Oh my god. How's that? Identical twins separated at birth? Do you flush the toilet before you go? <laughs> okay, yes, giving it away. Past your eyes milk. Oh, oh, can you believe that? You better guess the folks at that gallet at college went out and celebrated the rest of the day when somebody came up with that one. Yes, you can have puns in American Sign Language. Yeah, it's you and me there with the pasteurized milk sign. Yes, the very first thing you learn in most cases, this is a real language. You have emotion, you have physical prosody, you have accents, you have puns, you have poetry, and it's got nothing to do with lips and tongue. 